Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maya Luria with TMC for Seniors, and I'm so happy we've got our Tucson Orthopedic uh, series on again. And today we're going to be talking about, oh, my aching back. I have Dr. Adam Bevavino here with me. He is a board certified orthopedic surgeon, and he specializes in procedures that address simple to complex pathology of the spine. His goal is to form a collaborative relationship with his patients to develop individualized treatment plans that consider the whole patient, including their medical, economic, and social situations. Dr. Bevavino has a particular interest in minimally invasive techniques, enhanced perioperative pain control, and accelerated rehabilitation to shorten recovery time, lower your complications, and return a patient back to their normal function. Welcome, Dr. Bevavino. How are you? I'm doing well. That's a very nice introduction. Thank you. So we do have an online audience along with an in-person audience today. I've gone ahead and put your PowerPoint up so you can get started, and then I'll come back at the end so we can answer any questions from our online audience. Okay, so I'm up. My turn. All right, well, thank you. I, I appreciate everybody showing up. This is a really nice conference room that you have here. You have a neat little spot. Can everybody see that some people are behind? That's okay. You can still see the presentations back there. Um, so I'll just going to introduce myself and then just going to go through some of the basic uh, spinal conditions that I see in the lumbar spine kind of in a day in and day out basis and kind of try to educate you. If you don't already know, some of you are probably pretty familiar with some of the terms of the things that we're going to talk about, but just some of the symptoms they cause, the treatment options that are available for you. Um, so uh, just to introduce myself, so I'm originally from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, that's about uh, there's some other Pennsylvanians in the audience, but for those who are not from Pennsylvania, it's about 45 minutes northwest of Philadelphia, give or take the traffic. Um, uh, but uh, most people out here seem to know it because there's a Billy Joel song named Allentown. So that's usually the connection I make. Otherwise, if you're not from the area, you probably haven't heard of it. It's a medium-sized town. Though. So I grew up there from you know age zero to 18. Uh, then I went to college at University of Pittsburgh. I have some pictures. Yep. It's just kind of it's called the Cathedral of Learning. It's right in the middle of the college campus there. So I was in there for my undergraduate education. Then after I finished undergraduate, I went to medical school at Georgetown University, which is in Washington, D.C. Um, so still kind of stayed in the Mid-Atlantic area. Then after that, I went to my orthopedic surgery residency at Walter Reed uh, Army Medical Center. So um, <clears throat> between medical school and starting residency, I acquired a military commitment. They offered a scholarship for for school. I had a dad who was in the army, so it felt like the right fit. So I, I, I took on a military commitment and spent some time in the army for, for actually, I, this is, it, when it was all said and done, I was in there for about 14 years of active duty service. So this is just a new Walter Reed Army Hospital that I uh, completed residency. And again, it was just kind of up the road. Georgetown was kind of in the center of the city. The hospital is just further north of Washington, D.C. Um, and after I finished my orthopedic surgery residency, which we all do, we all kind of complete training in kind of general orthopedics. Although every, I think everybody at Tucson Orthopedic Institute then takes another step and we do a fellowship, which is where we kind of specialize on our little branch on the whole tree of orthopedics. And for me, that was spine surgery. So then I went from Washington, D.C. up back up to Philadelphia. I was at the Thomas Jefferson University or the Rothman Institute, which is a big kind of orthopedic mecca in that region. Um, had a great experience there, and that's that was, was kind of my spine surgery training. And then uh, after that, uh, as the military commitment goes, they pay for the training, so then I owe them some time back, which is what brought me away from the East Coast because all my training and life up to that point had been pretty close uh, to the uh, East Coast of the United States. Um, so I got sent out to Fort Bliss, uh, which is in El Paso, Texas. Um, so it was a big adjustment for me and my wife. We had two kids at that time, um, and we were very apprehensive because we didn't know anything about El Paso, Texas, except all the headlines you see in the news. Um, but we, had, we went there, and we ended up really liking it. We really enjoyed our time. It was a great community. Uh, we liked the area. We liked the people. Um, so we were there for 2015 to 2022, and during that time, we made several trips out to Tucson for you know weekend stays um, just to kind of get out of the area. So we. We, we had some familiarity with Tucson. We liked it a lot. We really um, didn't want to move back to the Northeast for a, a multitude of reasons. And 
as I was transitioning out of the military, a good job opened up at Tucson Orthopedic Institute, which is what, um, this is just a picture of what one of the entrances at and uh, the Army base looks at in El Paso. Um, so I, I was a good fit and I took the job here at Tucson Orthopedic Institute. So that was uh, June of 2022. So I've been here, part of the group now for just over a year and a half. It's been fantastic. It's been a great uh, kind of transition to back to the civilian sector after being in the Army for, for quite some time. So I can't say enough good things about it. Um, but that, that's kind of the long and short of me. And then I'll just kind of kind of jump in now to talk about some of the general lumbar spine conditions. So again, a lot of this is not new information. And most of you know this. Uh, and you can probably attest to some of these statistics. It's that, you know, low back pain is very common, right? The majority of people at some point in their life are going to have an episode, or if not several episodes, of lower back pain. The good thing is that in most cases, in the majority of the time, that it's a self-limiting problem, which means it doesn't last for very long. Uh, and usually, uh, it does not mean that if you have lower back pain that it's a marker of some serious underlying condition or some uh, obvious uh, bad structural uh, pathology. And because the symptoms are often self-limited, a lot of the time, which is if you look at the numbers in the slide here, about 90% of cases is uh, they don't really have an identifiable cause. In other words, even if you were to see me or another spine specialist, one at the exact time that your backside is hurting, we may or may not be able to say this is the exact reason that <clears throat> the pain is there. So there's lots of structures in the back, the bones, ligaments, tendons. We'll kind of go over all those different structures, but <clears throat> For some of these kind of acute back flare-ups, there's not usually one identifiable cause. And this is just kind of looking, that if you look at the incidence of back pain uh, over time, so if we look at everyone's you know, age group as you advance through life, it seems to peak mostly kind of in that <clears throat> fourth and fifth decade of life. And then as you get a little bit older, it kind of decreases again. And then as you kind of reach more, <clears throat> beyond the eighth decade, then the incidence tends to increase a little bit further. Now, so this is just some basic anatomy, right? So if we're looking at the spinal column itself, it's made up of several different structures. So most people are familiar with the term vertebra and not just, right, there's not a pointer on here, right? I can point to it this slide. Um, if you do on the big screen, it, has, it should have a little arrow. Okay. Okay, so there, yeah, there we go. But no. Make sure I stay in the center here. So the vertebra are just the blocks of bones that make up the spinal column, right? Then in between all the blocks of bones, which we call the vertebra, are the discs, right? So those are the blue things in this picture here. Or if you look over on to the left, here, each of these uh, yellow colored tissue uh, uh, structures are the vertebra. The blue things are the discs. And the discs act as kind of shock absorbers of the spine. Uh, they cushion the, the, the bones as you're performing your activities and whatnot. Then around the bones, so the vertebra and the ligaments, or, or the discs themselves, there's a whole soft tissue envelope that includes muscles, tendons, and ligaments that kind of keep the spine together. All right, so if you look at this side view here, and we'll look at lots of different pictures of this, we divide the spine up into the cervical region, the thoracic region, the lumbar region, and then the sacral region. And so the cervical region is, is the other term we use for kind of your neck, right? That includes seven cervical vertebra. And then the, the part of your spine that has your rib cage, that's called your thoracic spine, right? And that has 12 vertebrae or 12 different bones. Then your lumbar spine is what we use when we're describing your lower back, and that has five vertebrae. And then your tailbone is your sacrum. And those vertebrae are actually fused together. There's different numbered sacral vertebrae, but they're all connected together, which is different than the vertebrae that are up higher in your spine. Uh, so this is just a picture now is that if um, if we look here on this diagram and this picture here, the yellow parts that come out here, those are the nerves. And at every area that there is a disc, which is the spot between the vertebra, a nerve will come off on the right and left side of your body. So that consistent all the way from the neck down to the tailbone at each segment there a nerve comes out. And those are called the spinal nerves. All right, so this is just a picture now kind of if you were to take off some of the bone structure and look on the inside of the spinal column, this is the spinal cord itself, which ends around the upper lumbar or the top of your lower back. And then beyond that, it's just the nerves of the lower back that extend down and create the sciatic nerve, right? So 
everybody is familiar with the term, or most people are with the term called sciatica, which we use as a general term to describe symptoms that radiate down the leg. So if you look at the diagram here, the sciatic nerve actually forms somewhere in your pelvis. The lumbar spine, the nerves come out of the lumbar spine and then they conjoin or they, they grow together to make up the sciatic nerve lower down kind of in the buttock region. So even if you have a pinched nerve up in your back, we still call it sciatica because it can send pain down the distribution of this nerve, even though the actual sciatic nerve doesn't form until a little bit lower down in the buttock region. Okay, and then here's that what we were describing earlier, right? Uh, the cervical spine, which is up top where your neck is. I'm just trying to make sure I stay centered in the video here. Um, the middle of the back, which is the thoracic spine, and then uh, on the lower back, which is the lumbar spine. Uh, the, the, the other, the words that are, are shown here in parentheses, which is called lordosis, kyphosis, and then lordosis again, are describing the uh, postures of each of those spinal segments. So in a normal uh, spine, the cervical spine has lordosis, which means it has a curvature kind of in this direction. Kyphosis means the curvature is in the opposite direction, and then the lumbar spine is lordotic again. So those curvatures, if you're looking at a spine from the side, are supposed to be there. Right? That's that normal anatomy for the back. All right, and now this is kind of a cross section. Uh, of this of a, a spinal vertebra, right? So here is now looking at you know if you're looking at us kind of top down uh, and divided us into sections, this is what the vertebra would look like. Right here is where the spinal cord or the spinal nerves would be, and then like we mentioned, on each side there is a nerve that shoots out from the right and the left. And then the spinal cord or the spinal nerve ridge, like you can see in the other diamond, are surrounded by a bony structure, right? And that includes several different things, bone structures in the back, as well as the disc and the vertebral body in the front. Okay, um, so let's see. So uh, that's the normal anatomy. So there are several things that happen, right, as we get older, right, that, that the anatomy changes. So I tell a lot of people, as I've seen in the office, is that the spine ages with the rest of the body. Okay. So <clears throat> as the spine ages, um, the anatomy will change. So if you go back and look at some of the pictures before, you'll see that on these areas here, the disc spaces, which again are in blue, look nice and tall, right? The, the interface between the bone and the disc is crisp. It's easy to delineate. As we get older, as the body ages, that changes, right? So if you look at this diagram here off to the left, you can see this is representing someone who has some age-related changes in the back. And you can see that the, the now the blue areas are a little bit shorter, right? They're not as tall as they used to be. The interface between the bone and the disc is a little bit roughened, right? And this amounts to kind of a normal degenerative process that happens to the back, right? This diagram on the right here is showing something else that can happen, which is, you know, you can have an injury. And we'll talk about this later that can actually cause a fracture of the back. And that can happen associated with aging too, because our bones all get a little less dense as we get older, so they're more susceptible to having injuries. Um, so we kind of divide up the different types of pain, or so if I'm kind of seeing you in the office, we're going to try to figure out what type of pain are you experiencing, because that'll really help us determine what we're going to recommend for treatment. Right, so the majority of pain that we see is what we call non-structural or postural related pain. In other words, it's not a anatomic thing in the spine that's driving the pain. It's related to the overall biomechanics or an abnormality in the overall biomechanics that's then causing inflammation and pain in the back. So this can be, lots of times, it can be related specifically to an injury, like if obviously if you have a fall, maybe you do a, if you lift something and you twist your back, right, you're going to have pain in response to that. And most of the time, that doesn't cause a break in the bone. It doesn't cause a disc herniation. doesn't cause sciatica. Usually, that's going to injure the soft tissues around the spine. So that's when we start to discussing strains and sprains. Because it's all the, the, you know, on the diagrams here, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments that hold the bones and the vertebrae together, those are susceptible to injury. So that's kind of non-structural pain in that there's not a, a, a variation of the structure, but the, the soft tissue supporting uh, that the spine has become injured, right? Posture is extremely important for back health, right? Uh, it happens in young patients, older patients, 
any time of life, right? If, if our posture is off, right? So we're, we're not supporting that normal cervical lordosis, thoracic kyphosis, lumbar lordosis, whether that's by sitting in front of a computer screen all day, riding in a car for a period of time, right? Those are a lot of things that happen in our life that uh, encourage bad posture, like all these chairs that we're sitting in now actually are, are decreasing lumbar lordosis, right? So it's actually, it's putting your back in a posture that is unfavorable. And sometimes that can cause pain. You know, I see a lot of people that are in their working ages that have a lot of pain because they sit in front of a computer desk all day long. They're in a computer chair. And that's really hard over time on your back because it's encouraging a bad posture. So that's a lot of things that we can do. We can help. And that's, that's usually an easy fix. Or if it's not an easy fix, it's one that's tangible. And there's steps we can take to improve that. Uh, so structural pain, right? So not if, if, it's, a non, if it's not a non-structural thing, Structural pain is now when we start thinking, is there actually a problem with the skeletal column itself that's causing pain? And then we'll try to distinguish, is it something that's causing pain in the skeletal column, like the vertebra or the discs, or is it causing the nerve problem, right? So is it causing that sciatica or what we'll talk about later on, like neurogenic claudication? Because that will really help us determine treatment options. So we, when I see somebody in the office, I'm always going to try to distinguish early on, is this such a structural problem? If it's a structural problem, are they, is someone having pain from in their nerves or is their spinal cord being affected? Or are we talking about this spinal column? Is that where the pain is coming from? So these are some specific conditions we're now going to talk about. These are the most common lumbar spine conditions that we see, right? This is not every single spinal condition, but these are the most common. Um, the most common thing I see by far and away is just regular lower back arthritis. And the other term that will we'll be used to describe that is called spondylosis. You know, the medical community itself doesn't do us any favors in that there's about five or six different terms for this that describes the same thing. So if any of you have gotten MRIs and you're looking at all these different words, trying to figure out what they mean, a lot of them are just describing an age related phenomena in the back but we use so many different words that are very hard for everybody to keep track of even though they're essentially describing similar things so the general term for arthritis in the back is spondylosis right this will cause pain in the middle region of your lower back right uh, it is probably the most common thing i see because that happens to everybody right there's no one who, who advances through life and that does not have some degree of wear or arthritis in your back it's just how the body ages. Um, now, what that does, though, is it decreases flexibility. It alters the posture that we're talking about because your flexibility is less, and that can cause inflammation and pain, right? So this would be the spondylosis or arthritis in the back is going to be a structural skeletal problem in the back, right? So we're going to look at treatments to focus on treating kind of arthritic pain. Right, a disc herniation, right, that's when we see the, the vertebra or the in between the vertebra, the disc itself will spit out a piece of itself, right? Now, disc herniations in themselves are also very common. A lot of people, they've done lots of studies and they've repeated them over probably the past 30 or 40 years, and then they get MRIs in people who don't have back pain. And you know what they find? Lots of disc herniations, right? So, disc herniations happen to people all the time. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're symptomatic. But when I see somebody with a disc herniation that's symptomatic, that's generally when they're going to start describing that sciatic type pain. So people will say, I have pain. Sometimes it starts kind of in my lower back, goes into my buttock region, and then I'll feel it run down the leg. And the reason that happens, if you look at this diagram here, is that the disc herniation will kind of spit backwards into the spinal canal and it will bump against the nerve. And that does two things to the nerve. One is it's causing a mechanical pressure on the nerve, right? So the fact that the nerve feels pressure against it can cause inflammation and pain in the nerve. And it also in itself has chemicals inside that cause pain as well. So it's a twofold thing that happens. It, it hits the nerve and then it causes an inflammatory response because of some uh, kind of biochemicals in the disc itself that increases pain. Um, the good thing about sciatica or, or radiculopathy, which is the, the more medical term that we use to describe this, is that it's usually also a self-limited thing. 
and that in disc herniations are so common, we have tons of data about how they do. About 89 to 90% of cases, they go away, right? Right. So if we, if we treat it appropriately, we identify what it is, then almost always it's something that's going to get better, right? So if someone has a pinched nerve, you might have had some yourself, you know somebody, I'm sure, who's had it if you haven't had it yourself. The majority of times it'll get better. Um, spinal stenosis, this is kind of the next um, uh, kind of process that I want to talk about. This is, what happens with this is it, cause, it can cause the sciatic pain just like the disc herniation could. So it can cause that sharp shooting pain down the leg uh, with an acute onset. But more commonly with spinal stenosis, is that it's a process that develops like the arthritis slowly over time. But if we look at the arthritis picture from this diagram a few slides ago, what happens is the arthritis, instead of developing between the disc spaces, develops around the spinal nerves themselves. So if we look at this diagram, which is now that uh, kind of uh, cross-sectional view, arthritis has kind of developed around the spinal cord itself. And then that means slowly over time, the spinal cord or the spinal nerves has less and less space to function, right? So while that can cause sciatic pain, what it also can cause is claudication. That's the medical term for it. But what it means is that the nerves don't have enough blood flow in them in order to them to work properly. So the subjective symptoms are what you will feel is that it'll feel like your legs are numb and heavy, or it may feel like your balance is off. Like if you're trying to go over a carpet or even a small step, that you can't control your legs as well. And that's because as your spine or your brain is sending signals to your legs, that there's not enough space to let those signals go through in the nerves and they have a hard time getting those signals to the rest of your legs, right? So that's kind of the symptoms we'll see with spinal stenosis. It's not as acute as that sciatic pain from a disc herniation. It's a more uh, generalized numbness, tingling, heaviness feeling in the legs. Classically, and what I would always ask people is if you read a textbook about it, they'll say, when you stand up and walk, that's when the nerves are trying to work and that's when you feel the symptoms. But if you sit down, when the nerves are not being asked to uh, move your legs, it feels better. So lots of times people that have spinal stenosis will feel worse when they get up and walk, they'll feel better when they sit down. The next condition is called spondylolisthesis. So that's a big word. Right, but what that means is just one of the vertebrae has started to slip out of place. And there's a, about five or six different types of spondylolisthesis, but the most common one that we see is the degenerative spondylolisthesis, which means as that arthritis starts to develop in the spine, some of the joints of the back, which we can see here, don't hold on to the vertebra as well, and it lets it shift forward on itself. Right, so that when that vertebra shifts, now that can cause pain in itself because the vertebra is slipping on itself. So that can cause pain right in the middle of your back, but also as that vertebra slips back and forth, it can pinch on a nerve, right? And if it pinches on a nerve as it's shifting, it'll again cause that sciatic type pain, or sometimes it'll be associated with the spinal stenosis. So we'll see the spondylolisthesis, the vertebra shifting in association with someone who has a spinal stenosis. So it can also cause that generalized numbness, tingling and weakness in the lower extremities. Uh, scoliosis, right? Everybody knows what a scoliosis is. The scoliosis that happens as we get older in life is different than the scoliosis that happens when you're like an adolescent. So probably most of you maybe you have some personal experiences with, you know, teenagers that had to wear braces. They would go for scoliosis checkups. That is a different type of scoliosis. That scoliosis we think is a congenital or a developmental problem. So it's just how the spine develops causes that curvature. The scoliosis that happens as we get older is a degenerative process. So now as the arthritis, right, is, is advancing, right, instead of the vertebra kind of getting closer together, like we could see in that other diagram, if you want to remember in the middle here, right, it'll cause the vertebra to tilt in one direction or another, right? So instead of it wearing symmetrically, it'll wear off to one side or another. And if that happens at a few different levels, it'll cause a curvature of the back, right? So we would call that a degenerative scoliosis. I think I have a picture. So this is a, a scoliosis of, of the degenerative variety. And if you would look at the different vertebra or spinal segments, it's because they've all kind of worn off to one side, they tilt to one side, and that's what gives you the curvature, right? So that can cause a combination, just like the other conditions, 
just the fact that the vertebrae are collapsing down and giving you a curvature can cause pain right in the middle of your back. When the vertebra collapses down, it can also pinch on the nerve to cause pain to shoot into the leg, so it can cause the sciatic pain again. So I, I, if you can see, a lot of these conditions, even though they're named different things, can cause similar symptoms. Okay, and then the other thing that we, we will see um, is, you know, you can have a, a fracture, or the bone can actually break. And we mentioned this a little bit earlier in the talk, but over time, the bones tend to become less mineralized or less dense. Right, and that could put you at risk of developing a fracture, even if you didn't have a major injury event. Most often when I see someone who has a fracture, it's usually after something that seemed pretty minor, like a cough or a sudden twisting that you would not expect to cause a break. But if the bone is weak, it can cause the, it, it, uh, a compression fracture. Now, this fracture is a little bit different than like if you break your thigh bone and it snaps in half, right? This is a different type of a fracture. Yeah, if you look at the diagram here that's looking at the vertebra, it's just that that vertebra, because it's weak, if that happens, it'll just smush down a little bit. So it'll form lots of little cracks on the inside, but it's not like it splits straight across and opens up. It just kind of smushes down a little bit. And the term we use to call that is a compression fracture, right? And um, some people will develop over time, they can develop worsening kyphosis or that normal curvature we saw um, can get worse or, or become abnormal curvature if someone were to develop multiple kind of fractures. Because if you look at this, that fracture, that decreases the height of the vertebral body, right? So if it happens in several different locations, if the height decreases, that will cause uh, the spine to curve in that direction. Okay, so there's lots of different tests, diagnostics. If you're coming to see me, we will always we have x-ray capabilities over at the office, so we will always get an x-ray of your back if you haven't gotten one already by your primary doctor. So the x-rays are very important for me to be able to counsel you and understand what's causing the pain, right? Because the, the x-rays, even if you've already had an MRI, the x-rays are important because it looks at your spine while you're standing up, right? So the gravity affects how the spine looks versus if you have an MRI or a CT scan, right? That's when you're with you are laying flat. So we want to see when I see in the office, how does the spine look when you're standing upright, right? Does it shift? Does it slide out of place? Because lots of times that's when we see those, those spinal diseases that are shifting when you're actually standing up and moving, right? So the x-rays give us very important information about the overall posture of the spine. The MRI, so this is an MRI, right? MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging, right? And that's when you go inside of a big tube that makes loud beeping, uh, noises and it takes a little bit of time. Usually a spine MRI takes anywhere between 30, 45 minutes, maybe even longer depending on what's happening. But it's generally one of the longer tests, imaging tests that, that you have to do. And the real reason to get an MRI is to look at the nerves, right? Because an X-ray, these other test studies that we will show are very good studies for looking at the bones, but we cannot see soft tissue structures with those. The MRI is a study of choice. If we want to look at the nerves, if we want to look at the spinal cord, we want to look at the discs themselves. Right? So if you look at, at this area here, let me get my pointer, right? These are the bones now. So these are the vertebra. This is the, these are the discs, right? And then in the middle here, that's the spinal cord itself. And then we can follow the spinal cord and the spinal nerves all the way down through the spinal column. So that's really, and this is, this is somebody who had an MRI that looks pretty normal, but that's what we're going to be looking for. Can we see something that's pinching against the nerves, things like that? Uh, this is a CT scan, right? So uh, an MRI has no radiation, right? Because an MRI, the images are obtained using a magnet. A CT scan and an X-ray does have some radiation because we use uh, to obtain the images. A CT scan is like a three-dimensional X-ray, but it gives us very good detailed information about the bone structures themselves. But as you can see here, we can see the bones very well, but you can't see the spinal cord anymore. Right? You can't see the discs like you could on the MRI. So the CT scan is for looking at bones. MRI is for looking at soft structures like the discs in the spinal cord. This is called a DEXA scan. This is the images that you get if you get a DEXA scan. Right? A DEXA scan measures how dense the bones are. So if you were to have a fracture or uh, your primary doctor may recommend it to you in any case, it's to look, do you have osteoporosis? Are the bones weak? That would then require some type of medical treatment. 
So we do often order this study because that's an important diagnosis to establish. Right? A lot of times people don't know they have osteoporosis. And then if we, if we can identify that, then we can get you treated appropriately to prevent a fracture at some point in the future. Uh, one of the other, uh, so we, this is a kind of skipping down, but the other uh, three letter mnemonic I have here is EMG. That stands for electromyography. And that is to look at, is a study that's not an imaging study, but it's done by placing little electrodes into your legs, if we're talking about your lower back, your arms, if we're talking about your neck. And a gentle current is run through it, and they can pick up areas where a nerve might be dysfunctioning. So I, we will get that sometimes if I have a patient who has pain, something that's running down the leg, but it doesn't look like it really adds up on the MRI. Like we can't really see an area where the nerve is being pinched, but clearly something's going on. The EMG can help further investigate how the nerves are functioning to help us identify a cause. And then this is at the bottom here, this is looking at it, and some of you may have had it or know people who've had epidural or spinal injections. This is just what it looks like. Um, the needle can go into the spine and they, you can inject a steroid and a numbing medication. And if you do have sciatic nerve pain, right, that could help, right? Because the numbing medication, the steroid will decrease information, inflammation in the nerve and that in turn will reduce pain. Let's take a look at time. Um, so lots of different treatments are available. One of the first line treatments for this is we can give you medications, right? By far and away, the most common class of medications that any orthopedic doctor is going to use is called the non steroidal anti-inflammatory class of medications. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them, right? This includes over-the-counters like ibuprofen, Advil, Motrin, Aleve, all these medications that are listed here. It also includes some prescription ones like Celebrex or Mobic or Meloxicam. So this, these by far and away have the most, if you look at the medical evidence, have the most evidence behind them for treating musculoskeletal conditions. Um, the downside is, is they do have side effects. Not everyone's able to tolerate anti-inflammatory medications because there are some long-term issues with kidneys, uh, stomach lining, and even the cardiovascular system. So I, I, it will, all, will always be a first line option if you have not tried them. And then we have to get creative if it turns out that you're unable to tolerate them or if you've already taken them and they don't seem to work, then we have to explore the other things. But for first line treatment, so if you're going for a medication, you haven't tried anything yet, one of these medications, the non steroidal anti-inflammatory class is gonna be the best option. Now everybody knows about Tom and all that's down, that's the number two on the list, that's an over the counter, it's easy to get. Data for that is okay, right? It, it, it helps, it's a pain reliever. Um, it doesn't have the same anti-inflammatory effect as the NSAIDs do, but it can still help. Uh, other class of medications that spine doctors will use, and, 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 and probably a lot of you are already familiar with some of these medications, but Lyrica, Neurontin, or Gabapentin, these are the uh, brand names. These were actually were first discovered for seizures. And then as they became more widespread use for that, we were able to figure out that they actually help a lot for nerve pain. So patients who have maybe sciatic nerve pain, the claudication, numbness and tingling, it can help, right? Because they can quiet down nerves that are irritated, right? Muscle relaxers are another type of medication. So we talked in the beginning of the talk that sometimes it's just related to the muscles or there's a soft tissue injury around the back. So if any of you are, when you've had your back pain, you'll notice sometimes it can start in the middle, but then it can kind of spread out to the side. Well, on every side of your back, like we saw in these pictures, there's big muscles that run up and down the back, right? And if those become painful, they can go into a spasm and the muscle relaxers can help with that, right? So those common muscle relaxers are things like Robaxin, which is methocarbamol, Flexeril, or Cyclobenzaprine. There's also other ones like Tizanidine. Um, one thing that we will sometimes use, so if we have somebody who has an acute sciatic episode from like uh, a, an acute disc herniation, they have severe radicular pain, one thing that is helpful is a steroid, right? A steroid you can take by mouth. Sometimes we'll prescribe what's called a Medrol dose pack. It comes in a box. You take it for six days. But the benefit of doing that is that it's a very potent anti-inflammatory. So when you have an acute episode of pain, the pain is there because there's inflammation, right? So a Medrol dose pack, it only lasts six days because you can't take steroids for longer than that unless it's for another medical condition. But for this, we want to use only a short duration gives you a very strong anti-inflammatory relief for those six days. And sometimes that just gets you over the hump enough to make it go away the rest of the way on its own. 
right? And then there's a narcotic class of medications, which everybody knows about. We do try to, and, you know, for, for me and most of my partners, we're going to try to avoid using those outside of like a post-surgical period if we can. Just because we know everyone, I've seen them on the news, we know there's a lot of downside and risk to being on these medications um, for a long period of time. So we will really only use those in, if we don't have another option. In other words, well, I, I am almost always able to figure out something that we can take instead of the narcotic medications because of the risk profile that's associated with them. Um, physical therapy, I'm a huge believer in physical therapy. I'm a very a big exercise enthusiast myself. I think physical therapy has a lot of a value, right? Um, you know, it's both active and passive, right? So if we divide it, it's active because if you go to a physical therapist, you are the ones that are that's doing the exercise and doing the maneuvers. So your body is actively engaged in the treatment. And I think that has a lot of value, right? So there's stretching, strengthening. But in addition to it, right, so if you're going to a physical therapist that's treating you for your back, that's just part of it, right? There's also like dry needling, TENS units, tissue massage. So it's just part of the treatments um, that a physical therapy will have or the exercises and the stretches. And these are just some basic ones that they'll teach you for different conditions. The physical therapy is a great first line treatment. If you've been giving it time, the medications don't seem to be working. Physical therapy is great. Uh, exercise by yourself, like Pilates, yoga, also has tons of value, right? Because that's engaging your core, working on flexibility. Those are all things that really promote healthy back health or healthy backs. Chiropractors, people love chiropractors. Um, you know, our, the data form that we have is a little mixed, right? We don't really know all the time if it's gonna work for people, but as long as it's not dangerous or making you worse, I think it's certainly a safe thing to try. Um, and then there's some braces that we can give just to give you a little extra support if you're having a hard time with the pain. Uh, you know, a big thing, and I see this a lot with, uh, you know, I used to be, when I was in the military, right, this was a big thing, right, for, for back problems. And it was, we would find, you know, have uh, young guys that, we're doing something and they hurt their back. And then we could find a treatment that would help them, right? But if the next day, then they have to go jump out of a plane or march 40 miles with the backpack on, we're never really gonna get good relief. So that's when we have to start talking about that. And I bring it up is that activity modification is really important, right? So if you find something that's helping you, whether it's medications, physical therapy shots, that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is really paying attention to your body and trying to identify things that are aggravating your symptoms, right? So whether it's the job, it's recreational activities, it's how you're lifting, which is what this diagram is showing, right? That all plays a huge role, right? So the treatments are one thing, but then paying attention to your body and avoiding things that aggravate it are another. Uh, treatments, these are, again, we're looking at uh, now spinal injection treatments. These have a lot of value, right? These are a little further down the road, right? So if the medication the, the uh, physical therapy, things like that are not working. You still need to figure out something else to give you pain control. Um, doing some of these injection treatments uh, have validity, right? And there are several different types of injections that can be done. Usually that's done by an interventional pain specialist, which we do have over at Tucson Orthopedic Institute. And then the last end of the line is surgery, right? So there's obviously at the spine surgeon, there are some times that these conditions get to the point where things have not worked. And there's something that we can identify in the spine that we can fix, right? That, that's the real key with surgery, right? Everybody knows people who have had spine surgery. Some times you know people that it's helped. Sometimes it doesn't help, right? So for me, if you're talking to a good spine surgeon and not a spine surgeon, right? Spine surgery works very, very well, right? The big challenge is doing the surgery for the right reasons, right? If we do the surgery for the right reasons, it will work. If surgery is done for the wrong reason, that's when you start hearing the stories about someone that so-and-so had spine surgery, it didn't really help their pain. It has to be done for the right reason. But if we get to the point where you have an identifiable thing going on in the spine that's driving your pain and it doesn't get better, then yes, surgery is very effective for it. All right, so if we're talking about spinal stenosis or disc herniations, like we looked at the diagrams earlier, if, we're, if you're having those types of leg pain, sciatica, or neurogenic claudication, and it's not getting better, and we can see that the nerve is getting pinched, then going in, doing a surgery, which was a decompression, that means taking the pressure off of the nerve, is very effective in about improving the leg symptoms that you're having, right? That works very well, right? Fusion, right, so spinal fusions, which I'm sure you're all familiar with that term, 
they're really the only time we're doing a spinal fusion, which means we're going to start talking about screws and rods, right, or uh, some type of permanent implant mm -hmm. in the back, is if there is a vertebra that's slipping out of place, like the spondylolisthesis, right, because then we want it to stop slipping. We don't want it to keep moving back and forth. Or if there's a scoliosis, if there's a curvature of the back that we want to try to make straight again, right? So if it's for spinal stenosis or the disc herniation, we don't need to do any fusion. We can do kind of minimally invasive, small outpatient surgery to just get the pressure off the nerves. If we need to address a structural problem with the vertebra slipping or they're curved in the wrong spot, then we do have to do something a little bit more substantial. Still can do it through less invasive means, but it does usually remain, mean some type of permanent implant. Um, this is just kind of showing a picture of kind of opening up the spine and doing the laminectomy type surgery. Uh, and this is a picture of what a spinal fusion would look like if you had it done for a spondylolisthesis, right? So in this particular patient, right, this vertebra is shifted forward on it, and these metal screws are holding that vertebra in place so it doesn't shift any longer. By holding that vertebra in place, I mean, it doesn't shift, it doesn't pinch on the nerves. All right, so that's just a basic picture of it. And there's tons of different types of spinal fusions. Um, it, kind of the type of spinal fusion really depends on the exact uh, problem that we're dealing with. If you look, you may know some people have had it, you may yourself have had it, right? There's lots of different mnemonics to describe different types of fusion that can be done. There's advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, and that's it. That's all I have. Okay, we're okay on time. I kept looking at it for about set or four. So thank, thank you so much, Dr. Bevavino. I have a couple of questions that came in online that I wanted to ask you. Um, yes. One was about the effectiveness of the injections. Does that, if you, if you get multiple injections over time, does that weaken them it's, at any point? Do they stop becoming, in, do they become ineffective? Right. So I, I think that, so spinal injections for me, and again, I'm uh, uh, and not an interventional pain doctor, is that usually they will require you to space out the injections. You cannot have a spinal injections back to back to back to back because we think that the cumulative dose of steroid is it does degrade some of the surrounding tissue. So uh, they'll usually get spaced out a few months. That way the, the steroid has time to flush out of the system so it doesn't stay there right, before you get another shot. Now, in terms of having the injections done over and over and over again, a lot of that is a personal preference. You know, I have some patients who have spinal stenosis or have a disc herniation, and their preference is, I know that surgery would help, but I would rather not do it. And I'm okay every three months if I have to go in for a shot, and that gets me three, four months of pain relief, that's preferable for me. And that's okay, right? I mean, that's that's kind of, you know, it's it's very important for me is that, you know, the patients that I'm treating is you, you should be comfortable with what's happening with your body. Ultimately, you are still in the driver's seat. So it has to be whatever gets recommended, something that you feel right about. And if that's what you feel right about, then that's fine. You know, but usually if it's something, if someone's getting injections again and again, I would hope that they're getting the injections because they are working. But then after the medication wears off, they just have to get another one. And that, that's, that usually becomes a personal type reference. Okay. And is there anything with your shoes? So a lot of ladies are wearing heels. Is that something that's causing back pain? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question. No, I, I mean, I think, I think you're, you're, the gait is very important for back health too, right? So we see this a lot, you know, I'll get to talk about the shoes too, but if someone has hip or knee arthritis, right, that, that alters their gait or makes their legs a little bit different in length, right? That's gonna, that's gonna alter the biomechanics of the back. It's gonna make you uneven. And that will over time cause pain in your back. So the same with the shoes, right? If you're wearing a shoe that doesn't support you very well, right? Yeah, that can make a big difference. I mean, I think there is some validity to all the, the commercials you see on TV for like the Good Feet store and whatnot, right? If you do have a well-supported shoe that helps you normalize your gait, that will promote healthy back health or belt back health, it's no question. And are there exercises that someone should be doing to help with back pain or exercises that maybe they should be avoiding? Right. Uh, so I think the avoiding ones is, an e is, is one of the easier ones to start in that, you know, anything that you're doing that, uh, that you hinge at the waist. So if you bend straight down at your waist without bending your hips or your knees and then pick something up, 
that is putting the most stress on your lower lumbar spine, right? So those activities are very hard on the back, right? So if you're a weightlifter, right? If you're doing like a deadlift or something like that, that's really hard on your back. Everybody knows that, right? So if you are lifting, pay attention to proper lifting mechanics, like this guy is on the right, right? Bending at the hips, bending at the knees, bracing your core, keeping your back straight. That is a lot easier on your back than bending straight over at the hips and picking something straight back up with the straight hips and knees, right? So th those are the activities that are hard on the back. Great. Uh, the other things that are hard on the back, you know, to be honest, right? So if, if any, you know, repetitive impact, right? So if, if anybody's a runner, right? So sometimes people who have bad backs running is hard because you're you're banging your feet on the ground and that that over time is very irritating to someone who has back problems. And that also translates to being in a car for a long period of time over bumpy ground, right? Because that's the impact of the ground over and over again, right? These are, are easy exercises, and most of the exercises are going to focus on core strengthening, right? So your abdominal muscles, the paraspinal muscles around your back, because if you do have a back problem, the stronger those muscles are around your spine, the less stress the actual spine will see. Because if the muscles are strong, they support it, right? If the muscles are weak, and the only thing left to hold you upright is the spine. And if that's bothering you, that's going to cause a lot of additional stress in that area. So all these x-rays here, like, you know, there's uh, some of the easy ones are like plank activities, um, <clears throat> your pelvic tilt things. Um, some of them are hard to do. Some of them are not. But there's a whole list of different kind of core <clears throat> strengthening exercises that are good for that. Wonderful. Now, if somebody is in need of surgery, um, what what does this look like as far as you're coming in for surgery? Are most of the procedures now outpatient, or is it a mix? Yeah, so that so that that's a great question. Um, we, I think, in general, we try to keep people out of the hospital if we can. Right, we we would much prefer to do the surgery and have patients go home than stay in the hospital. Right. We just think that 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 leads people to be more satisfied with that. You avoid having to come into the hospital, um, complications associated with being in the hospital. Now, there are several factors that go into that calculation. Right. Some people have other medical conditions that require them after they like go undergo anesthesia to be monitored for a period of time. Right. So that would be one reason to keep you in the hospital. Other reason is after surgery, there is pain. Right. So if, uh, if you need extra time to spend in the hospital because we need to get your pain under control, we do, can do that too. For some really big spine surgeries, we need to monitor you a little bit closer and that will keep you in the hospital as well. But in terms of a lot of the conditions we talked about, disc herniation, lumbar stenosis stuff, a lot of that stuff we can do in the outpatient setting. I'm a big believer in some of the minimally invasive techniques. Now, minimally invasive you know, is a slippery slope and that sometimes people are advertising minimally invasive stuff, but they're not really doing anything. Right there, but there's a lot of legitimate spine surgery that can be done minimally invasively to include lumbar fusion stuff that can get you out of the hospital pretty quick too. So I will always offer that as an option. So if we're having a lumbar fusion surgery, I'll say, look, you don't have to stay in the hospital for this. Let's get you to the operation. We'll see how you feel in the recovery unit. Get you up, walk you around. If you're feeling good, we'll let you go. If you feel like you need to stay in the hospital, that's no problem either. We'll keep you. Make sure we get therapists to see how to get your pain control tailored. Right. Thank you. Um, I did have somebody that's commenting about that she has a lot of pain. Um, she thinks maybe it's uh, due to sitting in, in an office all day for a long, long yeah. periods of time. So she's yeah. just asking, is there a reason or should she should she go see, should she see somebody for that pain at sure. that point? Well, I mean, uh it happens here but but a lot of i mean with the ergonomics of the workstation i see all the time as a problem that leads to pain right um because like she's probably describing when she's sitting in a chair that doesn't promote lumbar lordosis so a lot of times people get real creative right you can adjust your workstation right standing desks different types of chairs that help promote healthy back posture a lumbar roll so you can put a, a you can buy those at any type of drugstore or Amazon or any type of retailer that you put behind your back when you're sitting and that'll encourage that lordosis in the spine. But, but work is hard if it has to be in front of a computer on a desk. We usually think that the laborers have it harder, but sometimes the desk stuff is just as bad on the back. So Right. And remembering to get up. I know, you know, sometimes we are yeah. at a desk all day long and sometimes we don't get up. So 
Um, I do want to share with uh, folks how they can get in touch with you if they wanted to make an appointment. Um, I'm going to put that up on the screen here, but you can call Tucson Orthopedic at 520-784-6200. I know your office is right over here at uh, TMC, the Tucson Orthopedic in the tower over here at T TMC. Are you in at other locations or just at TMC? Right now, I'm just at, just at the TMC office, but just our east side office. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. I want to thank you so much for being here today. I am going to turn it over to, I'm going to close up online and let you continue on in person with any other questions. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Bevavina. I appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks for being here today. We look forward to seeing you again. Our next presentation is actually tomorrow, which is Diabetes Day, and that is on Thursday, November 9th at 9.30 a.m. Please give us a call in the office if you are interested in this class and you would like to watch it online. The phone number is 520-324-1960. There will actually be two talks today for Diabetes Day or for tomorrow. Um, the first talk is what's new for type two, and that is with Dr. Cynthia Rivas, and she is a TMC1 endocrinologist and also whole grains for good health and that will be with uh leticia martinez and chef tmc chef carlos uh, again please give us a call at 520-324-1960 thank you